All right, welcome to lecture 14 in this introduction to proof series. Uh, today we're going to be covering section 3.1 from a, a general introduction to the art of mathematics. The, uh, the layout of today's session should go something like this. First, we're going to look at the same motivating example that's, that's covered in uh, chapter 3.1 in, in JIAM. Uh, then we're going to do a couple of direct proofs and talk about, you know, what's the, uh, the general format of such a thing. And finally, we'll cover some tidbits, little pieces of advice to help you along the path of uh, becoming better provers. Uh, and in particular, you know, what axioms you're allowed to use at what stage in things, which is always sort of a, a an area for of concern. So let's roll. Um, the motivating example is about the product of four consecutive natural numbers. It turns out there's a nice pattern in it that it's always one less than a square. So it says explore. Let's explore. Uh, you know, pick a couple of well, four consecutive numbers and multiply them together. You should end up one less than a square. So let's do six times seven times eight times nine. That's four, right? 3,024, apparently that's one less than a square. So if we added one to that, that should be a perfect square. Kind of looking like it might be with that ending in 25. What's the square root of that guy? Uh, you get the answer. Second, that key gets you the previous answer. And yeah, square root of 3025 is 55. So if you did 55 squared minus one, you should get the same number as you did for the product six, seven, eight, nine. Wait, getting myself confused. 55 to the two, one plus, minus one. Yeah, 30, 24 again. So that's a little exploring. How, how, how can we explore a little more carefully on that? Um, one way is to sort of use the the, uh, the table thing. You know, if you hit second in the graph thing, it'll show you a table of numbers. Um, and did you see how we ended up working this? We took the square root of the, the number after we subtracted one from it. Well, after, sorry, after we added one from, to it, right? So we, we found the product of, the, of four consecutive numbers, and then we added one, and then we took the square root. We, we can do all that all at once. Uh, yeah, so let me hit y equals, clear that out. What we want is our number, and then we want to multiply that times the next number after it. Now, I'm going to as well do this this way. x plus 1 would be the next number, and then uh, x plus 2 would be the one after that. And... Finally, x plus 3, right? And then if I, this, this number will be 1 less than a square. So if we add 1 to it, we should have a perfect square. Hmm. So what I really should do is take the square root of this number that I've just created. Um, these Inputting things on these calculators is always a little frustrating, but um, this isn't quite that bad. You just have, there's a key that says del, and above it is ins. That means go to insert mode. That's what you need. Hit, hit second and del to get to, into insert mode. Then you can put in the square root sign, and it, it moved everything else over, right? And the square root sign comes with a, an initial parenthesis, so we also need to go down to the end of the thing and make uh, trailing parentheses for that. Good. You know what I'm going to do? I'm also going to put in y2, just the variable x, so that we'll have something to see where we are in the list. That should do it. So, sec oh, sorry, second and graph. Okay, so when, uh, when y2 is 0, that's when x is 0, right? Because y2 is... 
oh, I, I see, this was sort of stupid of me. I don't need Y2 because it already displays X. Let's just fix that because I feel silly. Just clear that one out. Get the table again. Okay, so yeah, when X is zero, now that's interesting because the product of the four consecutive numbers includes a zero amongst the four numbers. So if the product is zero, we add one and take the square root. Oh, of course, we get one. Uh, when the number, the smallest of the four numbers is one, then we're looking at one times two times three times four. So a total of 24, adding one, get 25. Shorten the square root of that is five. I don't know if we can do this, these other ones in our head so much. Two times three times four times five times three times four, that's 24 times five, 10 dozens, if you want to think about it in old school. Okay, so that's 120. And 121's the square of 11, right? Now, most people didn't get to um, the times tables up into the, up to 19. When I was in elementary school, they forced us to memorize our times tables all the way up to 19. So I can tell you what 19 squared is. Um, but we can figure out it out from this too. It's three times. Wait, let's just put this a sec. Oh, that's another thing. Yeah, uh, three times four times five times six. Three hundred and sixty. And if you add one to that, that is something I recognize. That's nineteen times nineteen. Um, I'd like to tell people who are unhappy about doing mental math that there's there's a lot of tricks that you can use, and, and this is a good one to know. You, uh, you think of that 19 times 19 as being a binomial. Turn it into 10 plus 9. And if you're doing 10, 10 plus 9 times another 10 plus 9, What's the FOIL rule say about that? Well, first times first, sorry, 10 and 10, that's 100. And then we've got a, a 90 and another 90, so that's a total of 180. So 100 plus 180, that's 280. And last times last is 9 times 9, 81. 280 and 81, 361. So um, it actually isn't that hard to mental arithmetic your way through things like 19 times 17. You can you can keep track of the elements of the FOIL rule in your brain. And uh, I think that's something that's worth practicing because as mathematicians, um, it's very good to have a solid handle on your arithmetic, um, especially in the sense that you kind of know what the answer is. You can estimate things well. And if something's really off, you'll, you'll notice it. Okay, I kind of got off on a tangent there. It does certainly seem to be the case that when we took the square root of these products of the numbers plus one, we always ended up with a whole number. Right? There's no decimal points in that. So that's, uh, that's seeming like the thing works, or at least it's evidence that it works. OK, so let's, let's talk about the process of, of proving this. First of all, if you're, the, the question there is, is a good one. You always want to ask that question. What tools do you have at hand? What hypotheses can you assume are true for this, uh, this argument that you're about to engage in? And a great way to figure out what the appropriate hypotheses are is reframing the thing as a UCS. That's a, a universal conditional sentence. So we're, we're almost always, well, in this chapter, we're they're always going to be doing direct proofs of universal statements. Uh, if you have a universal statement, it's usually pretty easy to sort of recast it so that the, the statement that comes after the for all quantifier is a, a conditional. And so you'll have a universal conditional. Why would I do that? Well, the if part, the antecedent of that conditional, that's your hypothesis. Oops. Yeah, the antecedent will be your, at least one of your hypotheses. Okay, so let's refine this statement until it's precise enough and simple enough that we can prove it. The way it was stated originally was 
just the product of four consecutive numbers. That's how it looked. A, it had it for all A, B, C, D, and Z. If A, B, C, and D are consecutive, then there exists a K where the product is equal to K squared minus one. Okay. Um, are all those variables really necessary? Well, you know, I kind of gave that away when I wrote the, that formula for the product. You can express everything in terms of one variable. In the graphing calculator, it was x. Um, we'll just keep a for this. Yeah. So the, the product of the four consecutive numbers can be written as a, a times, a times a plus 1, times a plus 2, times a plus 3. And we're looking for the existence of a k so that that thing comes out to be well, 1 less than that square. Um, notice that I went to a universal conditional sentence. That's what we had right here. In order to figure out, in order to think carefully about what the hypotheses were, in the in the final thing, it turns out it, we don't have a UCS. It's just it's just a, a single equation that we're hoping to prove. Okay, so yeah, this is a good point. Notice what we're finally doing there is we need to come up with the K that works for a particular A. So given an A, can you tell me what K will be? So let's look at page. 121 in the book. That's uh, right here. It's a little off to the side. Here it is. So this is the proof of the statement we're after. So let's just read it together. Uh, suppose that A is a particular but arbitrarily chosen integer. That's going to be like legal boilerplate. You're going to use that phrase or something quite similar to it as the start of every direct proof. The phrase particular but arbitrarily chosen comes up over and again. Anyway, consider the product of the four consecutive integers a, a plus 1, a plus 2, and a plus 3. We would like to show that this product is 1 less than the square of an integer k. Let k be a squared plus 3a plus 1. And I hope you're going, what? Where'd that come from? Because that's right. That's, that's exactly the right reaction to it. But... Nevertheless, if you if you go with that, k is a squared plus 3a plus 1, we'll, we're going to make two computations. One is that a times a plus 1 times a plus 2 times a plus 3 is this mess. All right, a to the fourth plus 6a cubed plus 11a squared plus 6a. Hopefully you're also asking where did that come from, but, but maybe not. If you're good with your algebra, you can say, oh, yeah, I would, I would be able to multiply this out. Anyway, the, the other thing we need to note is that k squared minus 1, well, if k is this little quadratic polynomial, then k squared minus 1 is that little quadratic squared minus 1. Squaring out that thing and subtracting 1, okay, I've, I've hidden all the algebraic work. You notice that this is, this is a proof, so it's about concepts. It's not about showing all your work in an algebraic sense. You, you, some people prefer that, and actually... And more more often than not, I'm one of those people. I, I like to see all the all the steps in the algebra, but it's really not necessary so long as your reader can be expected to verify the algebra. Correct? You know, if you if you're writing for somebody who can be expected to do this little bit of elementary algebra, then it's up to the reader to verify that you've done the algebra correctly. So both writing and reading proofs are interactive uh, kind of things. I want to point out a, a couple more things just about structure. You notice how the, the word proof in italics with a colon comes first, and the, the abbreviation QED for quota demonstrandum comes at the end. Somehow or another, you want every proof to have a begin mark and an end mark. Because while you're in a proof, you're doing very formalized language, and it's just it's important to cue your reader in that that's what's going on. So let them know when you're starting a, a formal proof and let them know when you're done with it. And, you know, if you reach this point and you don't see what, why the proof is now true, this QED is supposed to make you go, what, what, what happened? Oh yeah, I see now. You go back and you realize, yes, the proof is complete. Okay. So back to our slides. Um, yeah, that did come out of left field, didn't it? The, the, 
k is a squared plus 3a plus 1. Where did they get that? Um, there's at least two possible routes to discovering that that particular um, quadratic in a will, will be the right thing. Um, I, I want you to understand that there's two goals here. There, we're, we're wanting you to become better at writing proofs, sure. But we're also wanting you to be, get better at playing around with things until you find the patterns, right? You want to, you want to develop a facility for exploring and finding interesting facts. And then once you've found those interesting facts, being able to prove them is, is also kind of cool. So where did you get this k is a squared plus 3a plus 1? So one option is you could guess and check at it. Um, that's not necessarily the worst way to go. Sometimes it's fairly quick. Guess, you think you, you've got a formula that, that works for the, the, the numbers that were appearing in the square root column. Those are the k's. Um, so yeah, we could guess and check. The other thing you could do is straight up algebra. See if you can do some algebraic manipulations to find that. Um, since both of these give us opportunities for adding to your personal analytical toolkits some, some standard techniques that will help you in, as you go into the future, I think we're going to look, I think we are going to look at both of them and, and mostly as an opportunity to, to add to that, uh, add to the things in your toolkit. So let's do the algebra first. Um, one problem we've got is a lot of times people have a, a hard time imagining how to multiply out something like a and a plus one and a plus two and a plus three. You can FOIL and you'll get those things in pairs. So you could do maybe the a and the a plus one and the a plus two and the a plus three. And you get, but then you have a binomial and a trinomial left over. You could probably just spot that, that um, let's see. A and a plus one here, that product would be a squared plus a. That's a binomial, it has just two terms in it. And then a plus two times a plus three, well, it's going to be, it's going to start with an a squared, it's going to end with a six. I think it's got a five a in the middle. But so, yeah, a trinomial. So, what about multiplying something like that, a binomial times a trinomial? Well, most often when, when you've encountered this sort of thing in the past, they just said use the distributive law. Distribute. And you can. I just find it ugly. So um, the table method is what we're going to look at. And this is a, a way that generalizes the FOIL rule. In fact, a, a, the FOIL rule is simply a two by two table. Um, so if you haven't seen this before, I think this will be interesting to you. If you have seen it before, maybe you can Skip forward. I should be able to put a timestamp in the in the uh, comments to let you know where to skip to. But um, let's just do so. X squared plus two x plus one times itself. The square of x squared plus two x plus one. You might notice that this this is actually the square of x plus one. So by squaring this, I'm actually getting to x plus one to the fourth. Um, so that's an exercise that, that is actually pretty handy to do when you're trying to prove that the rows of Pascal's triangle actually are the, the coefficients in powers of a, of a simple binomial like x plus 1. And you'll see, we'll get the, the fourth row of Pascal's triangle out of this. So how's the table method work? You make a table, and each polynomial's terms go in as headings on the columns and the rows. So we'll put an x squared heading, a 2x heading, and a 1 heading for the columns, and similarly for the rows. And then you just fill out the table by multiplying column heading and row heading. So you'll have x to the fourth there. I think I'm going to do a little jumping around. Um, the whole bottom row is just one time stuff, so we can fill in the the column headings in the bottom row. The last column is all some things times one. So again, we can fill in the row headings. 
there. Sorry, x squared there and 2x there. Uh, the other stuff, well, right here on the diagonal, I would have 2x times 2x. And that's 4x squared. And then these two positions are going to be equal because one of them is x squared times 2x, and the other one is x squared times 2x. They're the same. So you get 2x cubed in both positions. So, so that gives you all the terms in the product. You see that everything in one polynomial got multiplied by everything in the other one. The table just enforces that for you, that you've, you've made all possible products between the things, which is actually what the distributive law is designed to do, too. It's just more writing. All right. Um, the, the last thing I want to show you is where the, um, the like terms that can be combined appear. It's usually a very nice pattern. It's, it's particularly nice on this one that they're just diagonals. But usually there are sort of diagonal-ish things that will, will be where you find like terms. Okay, so x to the fourth is the lone fourth power thing. We've got 2x cubed and another 2x cubed, so it's 4x cubed. And then there's 4, 1, and 1. That's 6x squared, a 4x, and a 1. I'm off the page, sorry. Yeah, so I think that's a, a reasonably quick thing that you can use in many scenarios if you need to multiply more complicated polynomials. The, the, I did a, a trinomial times a trinomial for, you know, you could easily do a, a four-nomial times a five-nomial. Well, okay. So let's let's see the the table method for our guys. We have a squared and a as the row headings over here. So that's the product of a and a plus one. And then a squared plus five a plus six. That's the product of the other two. If I multiply all these out, you're going to get the product of the whole thing. I'm just filling out the table. A to the fourth in that position makes sense. We should get what is it? 5a times a squared. The next one should be 5a cubed. Yep. This ought to be just 6a squared. Down here is a times a squared. Yeah, a cubed. 5a squared, 6a. Just combine the like terms. You can see the two quadratics here, the two cubics here. The fourth power is unique and the first power is unique. So just add up those things on diagonals and there's your product which I think you saw in the proof. This is where that thing came from in the proof, doing out the, the algebraic work. Uh, so the other piece we need to do is be able to take the square root of a polynomial. <laughs> you know, I, normally you can't. But you can certainly ask yourself, is this thing we came up with, we, we added one because remember we were one less than a square. Uh, is this thing with the one added on somebody else's square? Well, okay, that's a great point. Notice it's going to have to be a quadratic because the the degree of this polynomial we've got is 4. So if, if I have a quadratic times a quadratic, I'll get something of degree 4. That'd be good. The leading term will have to be a squared, and the constant term will be 1. It, it could also be minus 1, but it's fairly quick to realize that it won't be minus 1 because the numbers we're, we're after are they're bigger than a squared not smaller than a squared. So, um, yeah, well, uh, let's let's just go with with that. that the, the thing is going to look like x squared plus something times x plus 1. Great, so this is <laughs> another chance to use a table, now with a variable in it. Um, I've already filled in the a to the fourth position, okay? You see that that would be m times a times a squared, m a cubed a squared, ma cubed again, m squared, a squared, yeah, ma times ma. Uh, that's an ma. Oh, and the bottom row is just going to be a copy of the column headings, right? a squared, ma, and 1. Awesome. So there it is. I'm sorry, it's really at the bottom of the slide. a to the fourth plus 2m, a cubed, plus m squared plus 2 times a squared. It's, you know, just collecting those terms. And if you compare this with what we actually have 
a to the fourth plus 6a cubed, etc., you see that m, well, if 2m is 6, m needs to be 3. Now, that just is for the cubic term, but if you notice, m equals 3 works out for the rest of the terms. Uh, 3 squared plus 2 is 11. Let's highlight that. And then down here we got 2m. Again, that's another 6 that we needed there when m is 3. So, yeah, we get the, the, the same thing that appeared in that uh, final proof. Let's look at the guess and check approach. Um, what does it say? By experiment, we can find the first several values of the sequence in question. I've, I've done it here for A equals 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, on the graphing calculator, I believe we took it farther than that, didn't we? Let's see. There it is at 1, then 11, 19, 29. That's the last value. Okay, but the next one's 41 and 55. We don't, I don't really care what the, the product of the four numbers plus 1 is, but because it's its square root that I'm trying to locate. Okay, so we, if we needed more data, we could use it. So here's the other analytical tool that I think will, will come in handy for you in your future lives. It's a thing called a difference table. Uh, difference tables are fairly ancient. They, um, one, one of the first actual computers ever built, while it wasn't quite a computer, uh, was known as the difference engine. It was actually a mechanical machine that could, could given a particular difference table, print out the entries in the, in the um, top row of a difference table. So this goes at least back into the 1800s. I suspect it's much more ancient. So how's a difference table work? You're going to usually work in a row. So you write out the terms of a sequence horizontally and just underneath of them. And then usually sort of in between the terms that you've written down, you look at, the, you write down the differences between the consecutive terms. So here's our, our difference table for the sequence we're after. We've got 5, 11, 19, and 29. Those are the numbers appearing. Well, highlighting across the row of this doesn't work. Five. 11, 19, 29. And these are the differences, 6, 8, and 10. 5 to 11 is 6. Yeah, 11 to 19, that's 8. 19 to 29, that one's easy, difference of 10. Okay, so if you had done that, what would you guess were the next number in the bottom row? You see the sequence 6, 8, 10? And I think this is probably going to be a 12, wouldn't it? What do you get if you add 29 and 12? 31, 41. Yeah. Do you see it um, in our table? 41 is the, the next number after 29. So a difference table won't necessarily allow you to jump immediately to a formula for the thing. Although later you can see that it does. If you take a, a discrete math course, it's common that people show the full analysis of how to use a difference table to, to devise a formula for something. It's also something that comes up in a linear algebra course sometimes. It turns out this is, um, there's, there's a vector space involved around difference tables. Anyway, if the pattern doesn't become apparent, in, in this one, it looked like it did. We had increasing you know, sequential even numbers, but you could always add a third row. So this is our, our table with a third row added, 5, 11, 19, and 29 across the top, then 6, 8, 10. Uh, it looks like the bottom row is twos. And so I put the, a two in question mark here because that's really what we're, we're thinking about when we say, well, it looks like the next number in this one would be a 12, that the difference of them has always been twos, so it ought to stay being twos. Having two occurrences isn't really enough evidence to convince me that this would be a two, but it, it turns out it is. And, and you can throw more data at it and see that it is. Now, there's the, one of the things that makes these difference tables so powerful is that there's an analogy that almost carries through perfectly. A difference table is very much like uh, a listing of the function and its derivatives would be in calculus. So the, uh, the first row is just f of x. Maybe I should say f of n since we're talking about a discrete number of positions. We don't have a real variable anymore. We're looking at f at a 1 and then f at 2 and Etc. 
But the second row is kind of like its derivative. When you take the differences between things, it's there's a fixed delta x, you know, letting x change by one and seeing how y changes. The third row is the second derivative, right? The fourth, if there were a fourth row, it'd be the th fourth or third derivative, right? The number of derivatives, that, and um, I shouldn't say it's it is the, the derivative, but it's similar to or analogous to. So it seems like we're looking at a function where the second derivative is the constant two. What kind of excuse me? What kind of function has that property? Well, that's a clue that you must be looking at something related to x squared. Let me keep playing with this. x squared is part of that. There might be other terms, right? You've, you've got a the, the leading term is x squared, but here's a way to approach this. Think about that sequence, the 5, 11, 19, and 29, as actually being this sequence, sequential squares plus something. 4 plus 1, then 9 plus 2, then 16 plus 3. Well, there's a nice pattern in that. Once you realize, hey, it has something to do with squares, and you try to write it as a square plus something, what are the squares? Um, this was happening when, when n was 1, or a was 1. Uh, so it seems to be the square of 2 plus 1. Here it's the square of 3 plus 2, and that's when a was 2. Here it's the square of 4 plus 3. That happened when a was 3. This is the square of 5 plus 4 when a was 4. That lets me guess the pattern pretty quickly. Right? Just using the difference table to find out it had something to do with squares leads me to a thing where I guess at what the pattern is. And that's a plus 1 squared plus a. And I don't even think I need to do the algebra for you, do I? To see that that's indeed what we got in the, in the proof version in Giant. All right, so that was meant as a motivating example to see some of the acrobatics that you have to go through in order to, to um, figure out what's true, what you can use, and then write a proof. Um, let's, let's talk about direct proofs in general. First, proofs require you to have good, solid definitions of all the terms involved. If you don't have good definitions, you won't be able to do a proof. It's just, that's a prerequisite. So there is a table in three point, table 3.1 in a general introduction. Um, there's a link in the video description to that as a handout. Let's see, it looks like this. So each box has one of the definitions of a concept from elementary number theory. Even, odd, divisibility, the floor function, the ceiling function how the quotient remainder theorem works, and then the, the notation for div and mod, div being the quotient and mod being the remainder. And finally, the definition of a prime, just thrown in there. These, these definitions should be pretty much all you need in, in the proofs we're going to do. I'm going to exhort you to do your very best to memorize them. I don't think that even an odd present much trouble, but make sure you know how to how to re-express d divides n as the existence of a constant k so that n can be k times d. That's, again, not rocket science, but, it, you know, it's something that you need to get it to the point where it's just rolling off like the back of your hand, you know it. Similar for the floor and ceiling things and the quotient remainder theorem. Okay, so back to the slides. Here's a good piece of advice. Whenever you've got a statement that's not appearing as a conditional, it's universally quantified, but it's not a conditional, figure out what you need to do to re-express it so that it is. And that way you'll know what your hypotheses are. Um, the method is, that we're going to use for direct proofs is, is generally known as this, generalizing from the generic particular. Uh, how does it go? GFTGP, the title of that slide, generalizing from the generic particular. Suppose you're trying to prove one of these if-then sentences. For all x in u, p of x implies q of x. Universally quantified conditional sentence. Well, look, if you've got any element in the universe, y, where p of y is false, 
the unconditional is vacuously true. You see that? Anything that makes POI false, you're done, because the if then is true. You don't need to look at those, do you? <laughs> you're, no sense in concentrating on the, the things where you know automatically the statement is true in those situations. But what we do need to do is cover the other base. What about Y's that make P of Y well, uh, true? Excuse me. So, yeah, we're going to look at particular elements of U that make P true. And then we're going to try to force that somehow Q is also true for those things. That means that we're in the scenario where the antecedent is true and the consequent is true also, and, and the, that makes the conditional true. We want to really be careful about making any other presumptions. You know, we, we're going to make one presumption that P of the thing is, is a true statement, nothing else. And that's why the phrase generic comes in. We just want it to be a particular thing that satisfies P of X, but other than that, it's generic. It has no other conditions laid upon it. I want to show you the outline in JIM on page 125. Uh, so what page are we on right here? Not too far to go. I think I'll just scroll. Oh, there's the definitions. Here's the outline. It's in a box. So this is pretty much how generic particular type arguments should work. You start them with the word proof, italicized, the colon, all that, that begin proof marker. And then you'll have a sentence that sounds like, suppose that A is a particular but arbitrary element of U such that P of A holds, whatever P is. Then it says dot, dot, dots. And then at the end of the dot, dot, dots, you go, therefore, Q of A is also true. Thus, we have shown that for all X in U, P of X implies Q of X, QED. So that's awful, right? But, but it really is how you begin and you end. You, that's a start. How are we going to fill in the dots? How are we fill in the stuff in the middle? Well, most often the stuff in the middle comes comes about by, um, well, like so. <laughs> okay, I, sh I was trying to, to say the words. Let me read it off the slide. Often the interior of a direct proof will have the following character. You'll use the definition of whatever that property P of X was and you are going to re-express that property in more familiar terms using that definition. And that's what a definition actually does for you, right? It, it takes some new piece of notation or terminology and tells you, well, but that's equivalent to something you already know. You'll work with it in that version until you get to the thing that where you finally go, oh, now I can take the definition and bring me back to the, to the newfangled world so you finally, you're going to use the definition again to convert back to the language of the desired conclusion. So that's, that's my picture of it. You're, you've got your hypothesis. The definition brings you over to things you can actually work with. You work. And then a definition brings you back to the language that the hypothesis and the conclusion were written in. So then you get to the end. So let's see a really... Trivial example, just so that you see how the, the format of a proof should look. I'm proving that the sum of two odd numbers is even. So now I've got two of them. That means I'd have to have two generic but particular uh, odd numbers. Suppose that X and Y are particular but arbitrarily chosen odd numbers. Great. By the definition of odd, here's where we're using the definition to move over to something that we know better. Although I know odd is itself not all that strange to you, but you know, pretend you're in second grade and, and you think it's odd that they call numbers odd. Anyway, it follows that there are integers m and n such that x is 2m plus 1 and y is 2n plus 1. Um, notice the actual definition, if I pull that up, uses a k there. It says x is 2k plus 1. Uh, yeah, let me pull that up just so you... you you trust me on this. Here's odd. The n is odd is equivalent to there exists k such that n equals 2k plus 1. Why am I using m and n here? Um, there, there's a tendency if you use 
the one that you've just spent a lot of effort memorizing, you end up writing it down exactly the same way. You say x is 2k plus 1 and y is 2k plus 1. But that wouldn't be cool, would it? You would have just accidentally assumed that x and y are equal to each other because they're both 2k plus 1. So just to get myself off of that mental track, I wrote x is 2m plus 1 and y is 2 something else plus 1. I can use m and n. This may be a poor choice because visually m and n are a little bit hard to see apart, uh, but well, it's done now. So, so great, we've, we've gone from the definition of odd to statements that are just algebraic. Right? We've got a, a formula for x and a formula for y. We know how to do algebra. So then x plus y, now I'm, I'm filling in some steps, but you don't need to. x plus y could have jumped right to 2 times m plus m plus 1. Because anybody can verify that that stuff in the middle equals this. Now, this requires justification, which isn't provided right here. But it says, since m plus n plus 1 is an integer, let me ask, do you believe that? If m and n and certainly 1 are integers, is there some an integer? Yeah, that's, that's pretty believable, isn't it? So um, I want to justify that, but that's coming later. Uh, for now, we'll take it on faith. m plus n plus 1 is an integer, and it follows, because of the definition of even, that x plus y is even, QED. So again, the, the structure is use the definition to turn it into algebra, do some algebra, then use the definition to turn it back into the language of, in this case, even and odd. It won't normally be that easy, but, you know, let's do one that's a little tougher. Okay? A um, little build up to this one. We previously checked that that rule, I said rule, it should be in quotes, is not true. Um, so we did that, right? That you can't just sort of distribute the, the, the floor brackets like that. Now here's an example. If x and y are both 1.9, then their sum is, well, it's almost 4. What would it be? 3.8, yeah? So if I take the floor of 3.8, I'll get 3. But if I floor these guys individually, round them all the way down to 1, and 1 and 1 is 2. So 3 is not 2, and so that's a counter example to this. Here's the thing that's cool, though. Um, when one of the numbers is an integer, it does work. It's a theorem. So how is it quantified? x is quantified over the real numbers. You see, for all x and r. n is an integer, however. And what we've got is the floor of x plus n. Now, this may not look like we just distributed the floor brackets, but um, floor of x certainly looks that way. Why is n not in brackets? Because they don't need it. It's an integer, so it's equal to its own floor. So we can just write it this way. In, in Jayam, it writes, writes it both ways, but I thought we would jump a little bit. Okay, so let's trace through that. Again, we can go to the text and see a nice typeset version of it and see how it goes. Here's the proof. Should I blow that up just a little bigger? Okay, so our boilerplate sentence is the start. Suppose that x is a particular but arbitrary real number and that n is a particular but arbitrary integer. Just linguistically, I had to break it up because they were in different sets, but it's still you know, the generic particulars, the two things are generic with no other suppositions about them, that one's a real number and the other's a natural number. Uh, here's an interesting point. And actually, you can, well, you should read this section probably more than once. But uh, where did A come from here? There's this sentence, let A equal floor of X. Why did I have that sentence? It's because the author of the proof, and you're going to be the author of a lot of proofs, has this freedom to sort of create names for things. Okay. I, well, I'm not a, a deeply religious person. I'm not a religious person at all, but I, I have studied the Bible and I've studied the Quran. If you, if you look at creation myths, well, think, many people will be familiar with Adam and Eve, that story. If you, if you read Genesis, the first thing that God has Adam do is go around and supply names for all of the, uh, 
creations, all of the animals and plants and things. That's kind of an interesting point that the authors of this sacred text thought that naming things was the very first thing that he should do. It, it, it sort of imbues the idea of naming things with sort of, uh, I don't know, a bit of mythos. Mythos, I mean, it's, it's powerful. So don't be afraid to create your own variables and name things that you're going to be lying around in your proof in a way that you like. I happen to like A as the floor of X, okay? Now, I'm, now that I've named that thing, I'm going to use the definition of the floor to say some things about that thing. The definition of the floor function, it follows that A is an integer, right? And that this inequality holds that X lies between A and A plus 1. With, let's be a little careful here, it's not just in between them, it's, it's less than or equal to A. Sorry, it's greater than or equal to A, and it's strictly less than A plus 1. So it's in between those consecutive integers A and A plus 1, possibly equal to A, but definitely less than A plus 1. Okay. At this point, if you were the person writing this, you probably wouldn't see that the next sentence is what you want to do. So let me give you a hint as to why the next sentence is what you want to do. In the statement we're after, we're trying to get at the floor of x plus n as being something. So maybe on scrap paper somewhere, you write down the definition of what being the floor of x plus n would be. What, what would that mean? And it would mean that x plus n was in the middle of an inequality with some integer on the left and that integer plus 1 on the right. So if you just recognize that you're, you're looking for an inequality that's got x plus n in the middle, right, and that you've got an inequality that's got x in the middle, it's actually pretty natural to say, well, why don't we just add n to each part of this thing? What are we using there? That's, that's an interesting question, too. What, what is, it, is it okay to add n to each part of an inequality? That's actually one of the axioms that... that uh, goes all the way back to Euclid. He called it a common notion that adding likes to both sides of inequality results in a new equality. Um, it's also true for inequalities, which goes a little bit beyond what, what Euclid was doing. But this is a, a rule that we learned at some point when we first did algebra, and we're going to accept it as, as valid. It's okay to add n to, both, to all three parts of this inequality. And when you get that, you get a plus n and a plus n plus 1, trapping x plus n just in the way that the floor function wants you to. So I just want to make a couple of notes so that we, we verify for the reader that we're, we really are doing the right thing. A plus 1, a, excuse me, a plus n is an integer. And the inequality above together with that, that's exactly the definition of what it means for a plus n to be the floor of x plus n. Finally, just remember that a was simply our name for the floor of x. Right? So you can rewrite this line, a plus n equals floor of x plus n. I've actually also switched it around right for left, but here you have x, the right side of that is floor of x plus n. a is floor of x, and n is n. Okay? So, and that's the desired result. QED. Oh, one thing I want to hit the advance on the slides. All right, so we've seen that first proof about the four consecutive numbers being one less than a square, a really a baby proof about the sum of two odd numbers being even, and here are an intermediate level proof about uh, the floor function. So you've seen a few examples. There are a bunch of statements that I want you to prove and in the exercises in this section. Do it, you know, really, this is, this is the meat of the course, so this is where you really need to um, step up and do the homework. If you, if you don't actually write some proofs, you're, you're not doing uh, an intro to proof course right. So some advice about how to do that. Um, well, first of all, there's some good advice in the book, which I want to just scroll through here. Uh, I guess this, this, this stuff that's on the bulleted list here is what we want. Let me just get it so we're all fits on the page. Okay. 
Um, before you get started, figure out what your hypotheses are. Figure out what is your ammunition for this argument. So that thing I said about, you know, often rephrasing the thing as a UCS will, will help you to locate the hypotheses. Sometimes, sometimes hypotheses are implicit and you have to, you know, read the paragraphs before to realize what the implicit hypotheses are. That's not going to be the case for any of the things we're doing. We'll have clear hypotheses, but I've, I've seen it more than once when you're, you know, actually doing research, you, you, you've forgotten that you were, had a, a sort of an overarching hypothesis that was part of all the statements. If you don't have the definitions yet completely in the back of your head, you know, as a as something that you can access immediately, then write them down. It might not be a bad idea to write them down anyway, just to verify that you do indeed have them memorized. So, those are both great pieces of advice. It, it's not going to be a good idea to get started without knowing what you have as, as ammunition in your arsenal to, to prove this statement. Um, and certainly the definitions have been key to, to making these ar types of arguments. The next one is just um, a common mistake that people make is to reuse a letter. It happens all the time. And you accidentally impose a new condition when you reuse a letter. So don't be stingy with letters. As the bullet point says, there's a lot of letters, 26 of them. If you know Greek, there's 24 more. I mean, you can if, if things get really bad, like it says there, you can add subscripts to letters. You can have X1 and X2 and X3. That's fine. Einstein did that. So, you know, it's okay for you to do it. Another thing um, I think people are leery of, writing proofs is very much like writing prose. Most people can't do it. Hardly anybody can do it in one fell swoop. Write a draft. Come back and critique your draft. Say, could I have made this smoother? Could I have done the transitions better? Then write a second draft. It's going to take a couple of tries before you're ready to say, okay, now I've got this thing. It's a, a clear, concise, step-by-step -step argument that nobody could object to. So don't be uh, the sort of person who issues writing drafts. Um, what am I trying to get at with this point? You're, you're, you're making a sequence of statements, right? The, an argument, which a proof is, is a, a sequence of logical statements. That means they should be either true or false. An algebraic expression all by itself is not a true or false thing. It's just something that has the potential to be evaluated as a number, but it's not even a number. Uh, but an inequality or an equality, that is a logical thing. So you want to make sure that your the things in your proof are logical statements, not just raw expressions, not just polynomial things. Finally, there's a, there's a, not finally, well, this is actually the latter thing, something I've already done, but um, a little piece of language use that people do all the time. They, they use the word if when there's actually no doubt that something is, is already true. Um, if you mean since rather than if, and think about the difference of meaning between those, you should use since, not if, all right? So here's, here's an example, a little snippet of a, of a proof. Suppose that X is a particular but arbitrary rational number. If X is a rational number, it follows that. What? Wait a minute. I thought X was a rational number. Why is he saying if X is a rational number here? You see where there's that, that use of the word if is bad? If I'd said since X is a rational number, you go, yeah, because you just said it was. Okay, I'm, I'm with you on that, and you keep reading. But you, you don't want these little jarring cognitive disconnect moments where people read something and go, what? Now I'm not following the train anymore. It's up to you to, to help your readers to smoothly follow your, your argument. Don't use if when you mean since. And the last thing is just a, a thing I've already said before. Write a begin proof mar marker of some kind and an end proof marker of some kind. The, um, the other end proof marker that is very commonly used is, is just a box. Draw a box, usually pushed over to the near the right margin. But a box. Okay, so that's it for the stuff on page 128. Um, the other stuff that's advice, because I know early early proofers have 
always got the same issue, I think, that, that they're concerned about, you know, what's okay for them to use in the argument. What tools are allowed? Sometimes, you know, well, there's doubt. You know, it, you may be afraid that you're using something that is, requires proof of it in and of itself. So what tools are allowed? The tools that are definitely allowed are axioms and definitions. Those are for sure. Also, if you've already proved something, suppose, well, we just did a little while ago the proof that uh, two odd numbers add up to an even number. You never have to worry about that again, especially if you've proved something earlier in the same paper. Or you're writing an essay, or you're writing a, a journal article, and you've already proved that, well, you would never do this in a journal article, but you know, you've already proved some statement. You don't have to redo it the next time you encounter it. You just keep going with the assumption that it's true there. So previous results. The way I, I would consider it in this class, personally, although your, your instructor may have a slight different point of view, so you ask them, but if you've already proved a thing, then it's fair game to use in, in subsequent proofs. Um, the reason that this may be a, an issue is your instructor may not have it in the top of his or her mind which things you've already proved or not. Right? So they may say just if there's anything that, that you believe requires proof, throw that in there too, which it's not bad practice, but it is, it is generally the case in, as a working mathematician, you don't repeat the work of things that have already been proved. So let's take these a little bit at a time. Um, the definitions that are on that handout I, I pointed to you is, is or are all the things you'll need. You won't need anything else in terms of definitions. So those are it for the moment. You should, good point, you should make every effort to memorize. Just, I shouldn't say every effort, just do it. Get them memorized. It'll be, um, it'll be to your great advantage to have the definitions of the things you're trying to write proofs about just on the back of your hand. I guess you could write them on the back of your hand, but you have to write small because there's a lot of them. Okay, yeah, and in other courses, and if you become a working mathematician, you just need to make this a practice. You need to know the definitions of whatever you're working with cold, because they're your lifeblood. They're the things that allow you to make any arguments. So with, without a, a solid understanding of the definitions, you have very little hope of, of making any progress. Axioms. This is an area where there is some question. One of the um, sets of things that you're going to use as axioms are um, things that Euclid called the common notions that he pointed out as, as axioms in the first book of the elements. So uh, I just did a quick Google search on Euclid's common notions, and this is the five things that they state. Things which equal the same thing also equal one another. If A equals B and C equals B, then A equals C. You might call that, in fact, that is known as the transitive property of equality. So equality satisfies the transitive property. I'll point out that there is a, a version of this that, um, that works with inequalities too. Let's see, if A is less than B and B is less than C, then certainly A is less than C. I'm going to transitivity of that less than symbol. If equals are added to equals, then the wholes are equal. That's, that's a statement of what it means to say you can add the same thing to both sides in an equation. That's what, it, you know, let's put it in words, but you've got two things that are equals and we add equals to them. That is, we add the same thing to both sides. The wholes, the results of, of that addition will be equal. This next one is just the same thing, but with subtraction. You can take away something, the same thing from both sides of an equation for two. He does not note that you can multiply both sides of an equation by the same thing and get something that's true. But you can. I would say that there's a common notion that, that you could skip. Um, things which coincide with one another equal one another. He's referring there to things like angles and lengths. If you can bring one thing into coincidence with another thing, you can move them so that they um, are lying one on top of the other, then their measures are equal. We're not going to need that because we're not doing geometry. That's another geometry thing. 
and then the whole is greater than the part. If you have, you know, if you have two things being added and the sum is going to be larger than either one of them. I suppose that's that's generally speaking right, although it seems to me that we get into trouble with that one if any of the numbers are negative. <laughs> right? If you had x plus some negative number, it could end up that the sum is smaller than x. In fact, it would. So uh, I'm not quite sure what Euclid was getting at there, but the first couple of these made sense, didn't they? We use the transitivity property of equality, and we we could have basic rules of algebra, adding and subtracting the same thing on each side of an equation, or an inequality, uh, maintains the truth of that thing. So that's partly what you can use, Euclid's common notions. The other thing that's going to come in very handy are a whole category of things that are known as closure axioms. So uh, probably not the piano axioms, but the, the piano axioms, Giuseppe Piano was a mathematician around the turn of the 19th, is that the 19th to the 20th century, around the 1900s, who came up with a way to axiomatize the natural numbers, it gave a, a formal set of axioms for n. Um, you're very rarely going to need them, not, the, not that they're not important, but if, only if you really want to get into deep logical questions about the foundations of math, do you, do you find yourself using the piano axioms? With one exception, but we're not going to see that exception for, for two chapters. So. Um, so what is closure? What are closure axioms? The way you say it is a set is closed under some operation. So that means that the result of the operation is in the set that you were, you were saying you were talking about. Let me give an example. Um, the rational number is q. q is closed under multiplication. We know that the product of two rational numbers is again a rational number. In fact, that's something that I would regard as, some, as requiring a little proof, but it's something we do know and believe. The, uh, another example, r star. Remember that notation, the star means everything in the set other than zero. r star is closed under division because the one problematic real number zero isn't in the set. The quotient of two non-zero real numbers is indeed a non-zero real number. So if you do the operation with things in R star, you'll get something in R star. And we took zero out so you don't do division by zero because that doesn't end up with a real number, does you? Just, it's undefined. Uh, some closure statements we take to be axioms and then others are provable. So there's really no need to treat those as axioms. So I want to highlight for you, what are all the closure, ax uh, closure statements and which of those should we treat as axioms? Uh, we'll take it as an axiom that the natural numbers is closed under addition. That is not one of the piano axioms, by the way, but it can be deduced from two of the piano axioms. Um, you could prove that N is closed under multiplication using the fact that it's closed under addition as a starting point, you would need to say, well, what, what does it mean to multiply? The definition of multiplication is it's repeated addition. So if you re add repeatedly, that's not going to take you out of the set. So it's pretty easy to prove that it is closed under multiplication. I wouldn't ask you to, but um, it's interesting. It's not a, not a terrible thing to do. It might be good if you're looking for a challenge. Uh, so I'm not going to ask you to do a proof of that. From here on, though, you can take that as a, a previous result. We'll, we'll accept the idea that both closure under addition and closure under multiplication are axiomatic, or at least one of them could be. Yeah, really the first is axiomatic. The second one is, we'll, we'll take it as done. Closure of Z under both addition and multiplication. We'll take those as axioms. It's conceivable to use that, that Z really just consists of sort of two copies of N. Um, but there's a little issue with how the positive and negative numbers interact when you're adding and multiplying. So it, it's, it's doable to use the closure of N under plus N times to deduce the closure of Z. We're going to just give you a break on that and say those are axiomatic. Now Q is different. It is closed, both under addition and multiplication. Um, 
but you're asked to prove those things in the exercise. So once you've proved those things, then there'll be previous results. Oh, good point. You're going to use the closure axioms, axioms for Z in order to prove these statements about the closure of Q. But um, anyway, those won't be axiomatic. They'll be things we did. And then, yeah, you get to treat that as previous results. Okay, so let's, let's make sort of a quick compendium of all the closure statements there are. The natural numbers are closed under plus and times. Notice that they're not closed under subtraction. Like 3 minus 7 is negative 4, and that's not in the set. And 3 divided by 7, well, that's bad. It's a rational number. It's not it's certainly not a natural number. The integers are closed under plus, times, and minus. You can subtract with integers and end up with another integer. Uh, but they will not be closed under division. True. So far, all of those are things we'll, we'll take as axiomatic in, the, in this course. The rationals, they're, they're closed under plus, minus, times, and divide. Well, it says with a single well-known exception. Is everybody clear what that exception would be? The reals, they're closed under plus, minus, times, and divide, also with the exception of division by zero. The complex numbers, C, those are closed under plus, minus, times, and divides. Again, no, no, no dividing by zero. But other than that, you can divide any complex number by a non-zero complex number, and you will get a complex number. So we're going to take N, Z, and R's closure axioms as axioms. And the statements for Q and C are things that we must prove. And we'll be using the axioms about NZ and R to prove the closure things, closure statements for Q and C. Okay, well, that is probably a great place to call it a day. So uh, thanks for your attention getting to this point. If you're, uh, if you're following along, the, the next lecture is gonna be about section 3.2. It'd be a great idea to read that in advance as taking two uh, approaches at a thing usually helps solidify it. So first read it yourself, even if it puts you to sleep. <laughs> but then the words I say are going to likely make more sense. So please do that. And in any case, have a great rest of your day.